Hi, it's time for a quick two minute teardown. We're gonna tear down a crystal oscillator. No, this is not a crystal oscillator. This is a crystal. Um, in the classic HC49U package you should be familiar with, you see that it's uh, just like a soldered um, is shut at the end and it pulls out and th there's photos of these everywhere in fact if you look on Wikipedia for uh, crystal oscillator you'll see a photo that I actually added way back in 2006 inside one of these classic HC49U packages but this is not a crystal oscillator it's just a crystal it needs external circuitry to actually work so I thought we'd do a quick two minute teardown because I don't think I've ever seen inside one of these. Um, this is a crystal oscillator in the standard 14-pin, uh, 4-pin dip package. I know that sounds confusing, but anyway, those little bumps on the bottom, by the way, are to uh, keep it off the PCB to stop the metal case here from actually shorting out any uh, pads or vias, you know, exposed vias or anything else on the board. Just allows some standoff there. Anyway, this is a complete oscillator. It basically contains well, it will contain a crystal of some description. They do come in many different uh, types and physical form factors and things like that. But this will also have, uh, in this case, it's a HCMOS uh, oscillator circuit in there. You've got, uh, there's a power pin, a ground pin, um, and a not connected or a, like a tri-state enable uh, pin and an output pin on it. And it outputs a square wave. It has a proper oscillator and an output buffer because this actually comes from the previous video where I actually had this uh, CMOS oscillator on here. And uh, I did actually consider at the time, well, does this have a bypass capacitor built in? But as it turns out, uh, it worked just fine. So let's have a look inside, see what's in there. Is it a same, a similar form factor as this with a little oscillator circuit in it? I don't know, let's find out. Wow, check it out. It is actually quite uh, similar to the uh, circular quartz disc that you get inside the uh, standard HC49U packages or a uh, lot of them. And then, then we've just got a standard 8-pin uh, dip um, oscillator slash driver, whatever that is. I don't know. It's their own brand. They've rolled their own or they've rebadged it or whatever. There's the quartz disc mounted in three places, which is interesting. Wow, okay. The ones inside the HC49U package only have the uh, two mounts on them. This one has a third mount over here. Wonder why. That's not FR4 uh, fiberglass. That's actually a uh, ceramic hybrid base on there. Although it's not really a hybrid because it's just a ceramic PCB. Hybrid would be like that actually um, embed the resistors on there and stuff like that. But uh, they haven't done that. That's a zero ohm jumper. There you go, that's not even a resistor. That's it. Oh, no, no, there we go. No, there's one cap. There's a cap. There is a bypass cap, is it? There's one under there. It's going to pin eight of the chip here, which also goes along that trace up to the power pin here. And it looks like the other side of it likely goes under the chip and connects to there. I can just buzz that out to confirm, but I'm sure it does. So this thing does have a bypass cap. So there you go. But that um, ultimately didn't interfere with my uh, test for in the previous video um, for the bypass capacitors. But there was one in there because this is the exact model that I used in there. Um, I had multiple ones of this. As a bonus, let's do one of these smaller 8-pin dip ones. Hmm, at a guess, I'd say all this circuitry here is going to be packed underneath the uh, quartz disc there. So it's just going to be like stacked up. Yep, I was right. <laughs> it was pretty obvious and oops. Um, yeah, they're very close to the top of the uh, can on there. So when I got my Dremel in there, it just shattered because these things shatter really easily. But it just suspends it over the top there. But check this out, it's totally different to the other one. Look at those mounting posts on there. They're actually springs on both sides there. And there is no uh, third mounting point like we saw on the previous one. So that's really interesting. In fact, you could probably come a guts in there if you weren't careful. Uh, because if the, uh, if the crystal forms some sort of resonant mode, a vibration mode with the spring, eh, you could be in trouble. But that's... 
that's quite fascinating how they've actually added the springs in there because uh, uh, quartz crystal oscillators, and I've done uh, quite a bit of research into this in, at a uh, former job, are very susceptible to uh, shock and vibration. In fact, um, I've done some research uh, actually shocking crystal oscillators. I built a jig to actually drop them and shock them and get the response. We put accelerators, uh, accelerometers on them and uh, to measure the response. And you would actually reset the drift characteristic of the um, oscillator when you actually shocked it. So like it would, like it's very small amount, it's very marginal, but if you're uh, designing high stability oscillators, which we were for underwater uh, seismic stuff, the stability is what mattered over time. And if they got shocked, then it would actually uh, reset that drift characteristic and you'd have to start uh, your drift compensation stuff all over again. It just ruined everything. So. That's, I just find that fascinating that they've got those springs on there. Are they? They're trying to eliminate sharp uh, shocks, which of course are directly coupled through the pins on the board straight into the uh, ceramic PCB and then straight up the shaft onto the quartz uh, plates. And they're trying to avoid that. Neat. So exactly the same as the HC49 crystal, again with a bypass cap between uh, ground the ground pin and what looks like, I'll buzz it out, but I'm sure it is the power pin up there. So these crystal oscillators, I, I wouldn't take it as an absolute rule, but two out of two have bypass caps in them. And, but they don't mention this on the data sheet that I've seen anyway. So what effect does this bypass capacitor have on here on our previous experiment that we did uh, where I uh, placed bypass capacitors on the uh, board and showed the effectiveness of them? I'll link that in at the end if you haven't seen it. Well, it does have some effect. It doesn't negate the previous video in any way. It's just that the effect uh, would have been more dramatic last time if we didn't have that uh, bypass capacitor inside this thing. But you've got to remember though that uh, that bypass capacitor is inside this thing which has those little traces running. We've got the leads on here. We've got the inductance of these lead lengths. We've got the inductance of the traces all going through there. And of course our reference plane here that we're actually measuring everything relative from is outside the package. So having the bypass capacitor inside the package it's not as uh, it's not the same as having it actually directly connected to the ground plane, the reference that we're actually measuring from, which is what we actually care about. In this case, it's going to have an inductor. Um, basically, there's almost practically no DC resistance there, but it's going to have inductance of the leads and the traces and everything else on that path. No matter how small they are, they're still going to have a dramatic effect at the frequencies we're talking about. So that bypass capacitor has a uh, nice effect on this chip, of course. It really helps it a lot. But um, outside the circuit, well, it's going to help too, but uh, relative to the reference plane, it's just a different thing. So anyway, what I've done is I managed to, I couldn't get in there with the soldering iron, but I managed to get in there with a uh, little flat-headed uh, screwdriver and just prise out the capacitor, just crack it, because um, they're uh, ceramic capacitors and they crack uh, really Really easily. I was able to do that without damaging the quartz resonator there. So it still works, but we have no bypass capacitor on there. So let's take another look. Now I won't go over the whole setup again. Uh, you have to watch the previous video to get an idea for that. So I still got uh, bang on one megahertz here, so we didn't physically damage the uh, resonator there. But look at the <laughs> ripple that we're getting now. Rather than just at the edge there, it's got all this other crap in here as well at multiple points inside that one uh, the, the one megahertz uh, fundamental. So that's rather interesting, is it? And look at uh, channel two, we're now two volts per division on here. This is crazy. So it's like the five volt rail is just going up by two and a half, down by two and a half. That's just ridiculous. That's with absolutely no bypass capacitors. That rail is horrid. But of course, that is driving our 50 ohm load, which we had there before. And yes, I am using the proper probing that we did last time. So if we disconnect our 50 ohm load, we should see that <laughs> improve dramatically. So there you go, that's with no load, and you can see there's now uh, no large uh, transitions. It's still very bad on the 5 volt rail, the blue channel here, at uh, 2 volts per division, but no large transitions that we uh, saw before. And if I put one of the resistors back, you'll see it drops in amplitude and you get that uh, large transition 
go in there like that. So that's actually sinking high frequency current into the load with no bypass capacitor. It doesn't have any bypass capacitor to store that little uh, gulp of energy that it needs. So I really should have uh, set up this video better last time, but let's have a look what happens now if I whack a, that 330 microfarad back on here. Still got no high frequency bypass, but if we do the bulk decoupling, still does quite a reasonable job. Look at that, but that high frequency stuff at 100 millivolts per division is still there. And look at the large stuff on the uh, positive transition here. There we go. On the positive transition, you can really see it. That's absolutely enormous. So, because it's got no high frequency bypass capacitance. But let's see if we uh, can see this change as I slide it. I'll start near there and I'll slide it backwards. So, here we go. There we go, look at that, and I'll slide, look at the level, look at the level. Keep looking, keep looking, and you can see it going higher and higher level as I move that bypass capacitor. So I've got it right down here, and I put it up there, and it makes quite a dramatic difference in terms of, that's 100 millivolts per division in that uh, high frequency ripple, even though we're not really using a um, real optimized cap for that. So let's try our uh, 0.1 microfarad ceramic, shall we? But at this point, any capacitance is going to make a difference. So <laughs> even the uh, big bulk cap up there is going to do a reasonable job. We'll find that this ceramic here is, there we go, that's near it. And we move it away, oops, move it away and it gets bigger and bigger yet again. So let's use that 0.47 microfarad film cap on there. There we go. And... Now let's try and replace that with this 0.1 ceramic. You probably won't see much difference because they're both going to be, there we go, pretty much both equally effective there. Okay, let's do the combo now. 0.1 and the 0.47. Come on, there you go. Sweet as. Oops, stay there, you mongrel. It does have a bypass capacitor in there, but that doesn't mean that you shouldn't use a bypass capacitor on that uh, device because you've got the inductance of the leads and everything else. So it's not as effective relative to the reference plane. And when you're trying, when you've got a driver over here and you're trying to drive another chip over here, and this chip, all the chip cares about there is the what's actually received relative to this reference plane and the power plane here. When you start adding little leads and everything, or inductors all in series and stuff like that, you start to complicate the equation. Doesn't look great, does it? But just put your little bypass cappy on there, and she's sweet as. Look at that, like I bought one. Now, if you're wondering what uh, all this stuff in here actually is, obviously it's not just uh, the one pulse and then just some uh, ringing in there that then eventually uh, settles out. There's obviously some very deliberate high, higher frequency components in here. So if we set up some cursors here, like roughly from one peak to the next, that sort of higher frequency stuff, we're looking at about, you know, 29.4 megahertz or something like that. But there's something more interesting, which are these periodic higher peaks in here like this. So this isn't like just your normal ringing. It wouldn't do that. Something is resonating or oscillating at that particular frequency. It's giving it a kick each time. So it's obviously um, oscillating something like that. So if we uh, move the cursor over there from one peak to the other, Aha, uh -huh. what do we got? 8 megahertz. Aha. Uh -huh. And you might have seen that in uh, some previous footage here. I might have to replay it. And I think even the previous video, that matter how, uh, well, eventually with bypassing was pretty good, but you could see this, um, like higher frequency, like little spikes in there. So let's actually go in and actually probe the crystal oscillator, it's the actual uh, crystal resonator inside there and see what frequency we get. I think this, um, in fact, I'm pretty sure this is going to not use a one megahertz res resonator. It's gonna use an eight megahertz resonator and they're actually uh, dividing that by eight. And the chip in there might be have some uh, pin straps uh, to give you different frequency, different uh, divider ratios, for example. So that might be how um, they might get the different uh, frequencies out of the thing. Obviously, you can't get like uh, the oddball ones with the same resonator. If you've got an eight megahertz resonator, you're not going to get, 
you know, the uh, 2.048 megahertz, uh, for example. Probe one pin. Hopefully we don't shut down the oscillator with the capacitance. Aha! Uh -huh. What's the frequency down the bottom there? 8 megahertz. There it is. So there you go. It's obviously an 8 megahertz resonator on here and divided by 8. And that's why you get that higher frequency uh, stuff. Yeah, there's some ringing in there. But as you saw, it gave it an extra kick every time the 8 megahertz um, oscillator uh, did its business. So you might have to uh, remember that when you're you know, doing EMC uh, compliance and the rest of it, um, you're going to have to factor in. In this particular case, it's a uh, divide by eight. So the actual frequency is eight times higher and that sort of stuff can actually leak out of your pins into your ground planes and, and actually radiate or uh, couple out. So, you know, you've just got to be aware of that. It's not a one megahertz oscillator. It's actually an eight megahertz divide by eight. I know that was slightly more than two minutes, but nah. I wanted to see inside these things. I'd never actually cut one apart before. And it's pretty much exactly as I expected. So nothing hugely groundbreaking there, but at least I know. And now you know. Hope you enjoyed that. If you did, please give it a big thumbs up. As always, uh, subscribe at the end, play the videos at the end here, all that sort of jazz. Subscribe to EV Blog 2. And as always, uh, you can subscribe on Patreon as well. Thanks to all my uh, Patreon uh, subscribers who often, by the way, uh, do get some, but not all videos um, early before I release them on the main channel. If you wonder how someone comments from a day ago before it was released, well, <laughs> that's how they do it. Catch you next time. And if you found that interesting, be sure to stick around for the uh, links I've got to three videos at the end of this after the end screen here. One is uh, the Crystal Oscillator Drift, which I talked about and the circuitry to do that and how we did that back in the day. That's a real old video. Um, and I've also got one on how to detect gravity using a frequency counter and it has to do with crystals. It's a fascinating thing. Check that one out definitely. And I've also done a rubidium frequency standard uh, teardown as well. Check them all out.